Good morning, Grace Harvest Church. Welcome to Sunday Church Online. Thank you for tuning in this morning. If you are new or uh, if you would like to update your information, there is a connection card posted below. If you click that link, it'll let you put in your information and you can let us know that you are here. Also, church family, um, during these times, boy, praying together has become very important to us. So I'm posting the prayer card uh, also in the comments below. If there's anything that we can pray for you about, or if you just wanna let us know how things are going, click on that prayer card and leave us a note. Thanks so much for being with us again. Stand right now and let's worship together. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so and oh how he loves us and how he loves us so jealous for me he loves like a hurricane i am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden i am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and i realize just how are for me and oh how he loves us so and oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh how he loves us
Good morning, Grace Harvest. I have just a quick offering thought for you, and it is coming from the book of John, chapter 10, and I'm gonna focus in on verse 10. And uh, this chapter is about the good shepherd, and it's where Jesus is talking about um, the idea that his sheep know his name, and yet there are these thieves that come. And so verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I just, this is one of my favorite scriptures. I love the idea that Jesus came to offer us an abundant life. And so whenever the things of the world are poking at us and coming at us, those are the things that would come to kill, kill steal, and destroy. And yet when we focus on Jesus and the things of, of the scripture and of the kingdom, Jesus offers us a beautiful, abundant life. So I just wanna encourage you to focus on that abundant life this week. Thank you so much for your continued support of Grace Harvest Church. Um, if you uh, want to give, you can download the PushPay app or you can click on the link um, that says to give. And um, we also have it at graceharvestchurch.org. So thanks so much for your continued support.
Hello, Grace Harvest Church family. Pastor Doug here today, and I'm coming to you for online church, and I'm really excited to bring the message to you. I'm gonna continue what Pastor Raul started last week, and the title to the series we're doing is simply called The Blessings, and we're taking it from the Beatitudes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Today, I wanna talk to you about what are the blessings? What are the Beatitudes? What are they really all about? And so um, let's get right into it. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read actually the first 12 verses. We're going to look at all of the Beatitudes. And then I'm going to talk today about the backstory behind the Beatitudes and why they are so important if we're going to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And so Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, you'll see it on the screen. Read along with me and notice what Jesus said. These are profound and revolutionary words. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Today I want to talk to you about the background to these blessings, what theologians call the Beatitudes. And just so um, you'll know, the word Beatitude is the Latin word for blessings. So we're just going to put it into English, and we're going to call these the blessings, and that's what our series is about. So I want to get right into this, and the first point I want to make, if you're taking notes, is that the blessings are a paradox. The blessings are are a paradox. You might be saying, what's a paradox? I don't know what that is. Is that two docs? <laughs> no, a paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. A situation, person, or thing that combines contradictory features or qualities. Paradoxes exist all the time. They, they tend to be things that seem like they shouldn't work. They seem like they contradict one another. And yet in the end, they end up being true. And if you look at these particular blessings that Jesus lays out here, they are filled with paradox. For instance, most of us don't see the virtue or the state of being poor or mourning or being meek. Who wants to be meek? When we hear meek, we hear weak. But in Jesus' culture, the idea of meekness was to restrain strength, to restrain power, and to be humble rather than exercise it with anger or with authority. And so when the scripture says, blessed are you in these states, it's telling us something that doesn't seem to make sense. When's the last time you knew somebody that said, I'm just so blessed I'm poor in spirit. I'm just so blessed that I'm meek. I'm just so blessed that I'm in mourning. And yet Jesus says you're blessed when you're poor in spirit, when you mourn, when you're meek, when you hunger and thirst, etc., etc. These are states of blessing. He redefines those terms to be the truly blessed state of of being and the blessed state of mind for those of us in the kingdom of God. Now, unfortunately, that's hard for us to understand because we live in a culture that 
doesn't see those things as being a blessing, but rather a curse, and our beatitudes, our blessings would be a little bit different. Let me illustrate it. Brian Wilkerson, a pastor in a sermon called The Heartbreak Gospel, says this, suppose we were to come up with a set of beatitudes or blessings for the 21st century. What if we made a list of the kinds of people who seem to be well off, who seem to have it all, to have it made by today's standards? It might go something like this. Blessed are the rich and famous because they can always get a seat at the best restaurants. Blessed are the good looking for they shall be on the cover of People magazine. Blessed are those who party, for they know how to have fun. Blessed are those who take first place in the the division, for they have momentum going into the playoffs. Go Hawks! Blessed are the movers and shakers, for they shall make a name for themselves. Blessed are those who demand their rights, for they shall not be overlooked. Blessed are the healthy and the fit, because they don't mind being seen in a bathing suit. I think that should be different. They, don't, they want to be seen in a bathing suit. And blessed are those who make it to the top, because they get to look down on everyone else. Those would be our beatitudes. Those would be our blessings. But in the kingdom of Jesus, they are a complete contradiction and antithesis to the true blessings. The second thing I want you to see is that the blessings are the result of a spirit-led kingdom of God kind of life, the life that God has for us, the life that he designed for us in the beginning. These blessings are the result of a spirit-filled, spirit-led kingdom of God kind of life the kind of life you really want, that I really want, the kind of life we're actually striving for. And we look in all the wrong places and we miss that life so often because we don't recognize it's actually what will fulfill us and give us joy and pleasure and a sense of fulfillment in life. Now, this is really important that we understand this kingdom of God kind of life. Let let me remind you of what was going on and give you a little bit of context in the time that Jesus lived. So when Jesus came on the scene, the nation of Israel was called Judea, and it was under the rule of Rome. It was a province in the Roman Empire. And those people, the Jewish people in that area, in that region, were under the tyranny of one of the most powerful empires in human history. Everywhere they looked, there was an occupying army. Everywhere they looked, they were under the heel of Rome's authority and power. They were oppressed. They were beaten down. Sometimes they were killed and slaughtered. It was much more brutal than any regime that we know of right now. There are regimes in the world that are as bad, but none of them had the overall reach and authority of Rome. And here the Jewish people were praying for and looking for the day that their Messiah would come because their Messiah, in their mind, was going to be a king who rode a white horse and commanded an army, and that king would overthrow Rome's power and regain Israel as the greatest nation on earth, as the top of the nations. And so they were waiting for this Messiah to come, and one of the things Messiah would do is he would bring a new kingdom. He would tell them that the kingdom was coming, the kingdom was at hand. And so Jesus comes along and the very first message he preaches, after he's water baptized by John the Baptist, he comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and then he goes into the wilderness for 40 days, he's tempted by the devil, he comes out of the wilderness, and one of the gospels says he comes out in the power of the Spirit. And as he comes out of the wilderness, in the power of the Spirit, he finally inaugurates and begins his new ministry. And as he begins his new ministry, his message that he declares to everyone is found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. The very first thing Jesus ever preached, listen to what it says, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, it's really important that we understand what this text is telling us because it lays the foundation for the blessings, the Beatitudes. The first thing I want you to notice are the words, that time. This is when Jesus begins his ministry. He launched a new age, and this new age is the age of his kingdom on earth. That kingdom comes as the Holy Spirit moves through him, as he brings the power of the Holy Spirit, the message of the Holy Spirit, as he brings the message of his Father, and everywhere he goes, he does miracles, and he heals, and he proclaims freedom to captives and liberation to those who are bound. As he goes about doing that, he is inaugurating a time when God's rule is coming to the earth. The very message the nation was looking for, the kingdom is at hand, that's what Jesus was doing. And he, from that time, he began to proclaim it. And listen to what he says. He says two things. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I've, I've shared this with you a lot, but repent, many times when we think of that word, we think about it negatively. But what repent means, it doesn't mean, you filthy sinner, repent from your sins, you scumbag, and turn to God before you get burned in hell, or he makes a grease spot of you on the ground. That's not what it means. Repent means to change your mind, to change your thinking, to change your way of seeing the world and reality. It means to turn to God's kingdom way of thinking, and God's way of seeing the world. This change of mind will change your choices, your emotions, and your will, and your entire approach to life. And then he says, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Romans 14, 17 tells us that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so that's God's rule and God's reign on earth will begin to operate in and through you as you're repenting and God's atmosphere and environment will be here now. So when Jesus says repent, he says quit thinking the way you've been thinking about the kingdom, quit thinking the way you've been thinking about the Messiah, quit thinking the way you've been thinking about God's relationship with humanity, that it's only for you Jewish people. Repent, change all your thinking for my kingdom is within your reach and it's righteousness, peace, and joy. I'm coming to address the human heart, not political systems. Yes, I'm going to deal with political systems as I deal with the human heart. And this is really important for us to understand, even living in the time that we live right now, because the truth is, is change ultimately cannot come just through political systems or candidates or parties or any of that. Change must begin in the human heart. And when Jesus came on the scene, he said, change your mind, change your thinking, turn around for my rule and my reign is within your reach and it's going to change everything and it's going to begin from the inside out and it's going to be the invasion of the Holy Spirit upon your life, bringing rightness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is really important for us to understand. John Stott is a British theologian and, and a theologian that I really, really respect. And this is what he says. The Sermon on the Mount describes what human life and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God. The Sermon on the Mount is the most complete delineation anywhere in the New Testament of the Christian counterculture. Here is a Christian value system, ethical standard, religious devotion, attitude to money, ambition, lifestyle, and a network of relationships, all of which are totally at variance with those of the non-Christian world. And this Christian counterculture is the life of the kingdom of God, a fully human life indeed, but lived out under divine rule. And that divine rule comes from the Holy Spirit indwelling us. So when Jesus says, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he now in Matthew 5 gets into what that looks like. So when we read the Sermon on the Mount, what we're seeing is the manifesto of Jesus, the Jesus manifesto to what life lived under the kingdom of heaven's rule on earth looks like. 
So if you've ever wanted to know really, truly what a Jesus society would look like, we look at chapter five, six, and seven and what he preaches. And in those three chapters, he lays out for us the true manifesto of the kingdom of God on planet earth. And here in the Beatitudes, he captures, you might say, the heart, the essence, the spirit, the ethos, the underlying sense of atmosphere and values of what holds that kingdom of God together. And that's so important when we read that, Other, uh, read them. Otherwise, we just look at them and they're just kind of like pie in the sky, things that we don't really understand. But if we understand that the heart of Jesus, that this is my heart, my spirit for how we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit and live out that life. So these blessings then are for followers of Jesus. This is what following Jesus is to look like in our life. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Now I want you to see the scene. There's a giant crowd. Jesus is down with the crowd and his disciples are around and there's a massive multitude of people. And he starts to walk up the mountain and he obviously is doing it to create separation between him and the crowd. And as he goes up the mountain, he goes up a ways and he sits down and his disciples come up to him and they sit down around him. And they are the ones that he teaches here. So the Sermon on the Mount was for those who followed him most closely. It's like he's saying, I know there are always going to be people who love my miracles and who love the things I have to say, but there's a group that I'm calling to myself, and those are going to be the ones who truly follow me through the thick and the thin. And and then we come to what Pastor Raul taught last week, and this is where I'm going to wrap up. And that is last week, Pastor Raul taught us the first beatitude, and that is blessed, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he showed us something, and this is where I want to end. That particular blessing, that beatitude, is the key that unlocks the door to all the others. So if we're going to understand the beatitudes, the blessings, and we want to receive them in our life, we have to understand that that first blessing is the key to the door. And when we experience that blessing on our life that unlocks the door and it opens up into all the other elements of a kingdom life in Jesus Christ. And so what did we learn last week from Pastor Raul and he did a masterful job. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What did that mean? The humble, the needy, the beggars, the destitute, the helpless in spirit, people who recognize their spiritual poverty, recognize they can bring nothing to the table that merits their salvation, that merits God's kingdom coming into their life, that merits acceptance, and so they have to trust in Him alone. Blessed are those who recognize it, and when they do, what happens? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's that mean? The kingdom comes. That kingdom Jesus has been proclaiming floods into their life through the Holy Spirit. By the way, the kingdom is always in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the kingdom is in the person, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit fills a human heart, the human heart is filled with the kingdom. And so he's saying, listen, when you're needy, when you feel like you have nothing to bring to the table, when you're poor, when you're humble, when you're broken, when you're destitute of spirit, when you realize I don't have anything to offer God except who I am in my sinfulness, my brokenness, and that's a regular recognition, what happens? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And your life is flooded with the kingdom of heaven. And you are able then to enter into all these other elements of the blessings of God. Yours is the kingdom of heaven when you come before God in humility. And you can see how this is so countercultural to everything we're experiencing in our world right now. Everything we're experiencing in social media, on the news, wherever we turn, um, People are angry at each other, proud, arrogant. People don't humble themselves. And there isn't that attitude of meekness or humility or brokenness or spiritual poverty. But Jesus is calling us to that. He's calling us to that. And that humility opens the door to everything else. So with that said, I just want to say to you today, and here's my appeal to you. As a follower of Jesus Christ, will you pray with me? Will you pray for your own life that God will give you the spirit 
of his kingdom and that the beatitudes, the blessings would flood your life. And then you'll see that truly you can be blessed. And that word blessed means happy, joyful, full of a sense of inner well-being. That inner well-being, that blessedness floods your life when you are under kingdom rule, when you recognize that Christ indwells you. Amen. Let's pray together and let's thank God that he wants to bless our lives. Let's pray. Father, I pray your blessing upon all my brothers and sisters and upon everybody watching this. I thank you for the family of God and I pray right now that you would flood our lives with these blessings, that we would know what it means to be poor in spirit, to mourn as you call us to mourn and we're gonna learn about next week, to be meek, Lord, and inherit the earth, and Lord, to be pure in heart and all the others, Lord, I pray that you would flood our lives and we would see that these things are relevant and important and they count for where we're at right now. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, bless the family of God, the Grace Harvest Church family, I ask you, amen. God bless you, church. Thank you for watching this video and being a part of our online service. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine on you.